So my name is uh, Ash Tiwari. I'm chairman of urology at, the, at Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine, and I'm also director of uh, Prostate Cancer Center of Excellence in Tish uh, Cancer Center. So prostate cancer is one of the um, commonest cancers which impact men. And uh, it's basically a cancerous growth which starts with cell dividing in an uncontrolled manner, becoming larger and larger in size within the prostate, ultimately getting out of the prostate and spreading to the lymph nodes, surrounding areas, or sometimes even to the bones. So cancer of the prostate essentially is an uncontrolled growth of cells starting from prostate, but spreading in the rest of the body and ultimately managing to kill about 34,000 men just in the United States every year. Any man who, ha who is uh, more than 55 years of age can get prostate cancer, but men who have a positive family history of uh, other parents, uh, other uncles, brothers having had prostate cancer, moms, aunts, or someone else having had a breast cancer, maybe a little bit more prone, People uh, who come from uh, um, uh, higher risk uh, families, such as uh, black men, have got a higher risk of prostate cancer. People who are exposed to Agent Orange may be at a high risk for prostate cancer. Even the first responders were at high risk for prostate cancer. There are many things we don't know about prostate cancer, but anyone can be at risk of developing prostate cancer as men grow older. So the CASH-22 is that uh, when this cancer is potentially curable, it doesn't produce any symptoms or signs. There could be a sign if we do an exam and we find something little hard or uh, uh, abnormal in a rectal exam, that could be one of the signs, but mostly prostate cancer remains asymptomatic in an earlier part. But when it grows more advanced, then you can have a patient who is having blood in the urine who is having pain in the pelvis, who is having difficulty in passing urine, who can have blockage of uh, kidneys, who can have bone pain, and who can have swelling in the legs and other parts of the body. So nutshell, early on, no symptoms. Later on, many symptoms, as I mentioned. There are many approaches in preventing prostate cancer. I'm not sure if everything is very successful in preventing. But the key here is finding a cancer early may be one of the best strategies to win this cancer. Having said that, there are certain lifestyle changes reduces risk of prostate cancer, and they include uh, healthy living, less red meat, less animal fat, less sugar, more green leafy vegetables, reducing inflammation in body, there was even a clinical trial in which uh, we tried to reduce prostate cancer by giving medications which were blocking 5-alpha reductase uh, enzyme from activating the androgen receptor. <clears throat> that trial did show reduction in, in prostate cancer, but there were some minor, minor concerns that uh, while it reduced the risk of prostate cancer, it may have uh, exposed uh, appearance of a little bit more aggressive prostate cancer. But in a nutshell, again, 5-alpha yeah, um, reductase inhibitors have been shown to reduce risk of prostate cancer. But most of the time, what we do is to ask for and dietary changes, lifestyle changes, exercise, and a preventive mindset, basically showing up for screening, showing up for uh, PSA discussions, showing up for finding risk of prostate cancer. That would be a safe approach. So PSA, in my mind, essentially means uh, please stay alert. The technical name for this thing is uh, prostate-specific antigen. Basically, it's in chemical produced by prostate to liquefy semen, but it also has some enzymes which help in fighting infections and other bodily functions in the sexual and reproductive system. But most of the time, PSA has become a marker for prostate cancer because most men, when they have prostate cancer, they have a little elevation in PSA values. So PSA can be used as an initial screening test for 
predicting risk of prostate cancer. It's not the most accurate test in terms of that everyone who has an elevated PSA will have prostate cancer, but it's an initial triage, initial trigger, and I think it's an important test for men to be aware of it. About 55 years of age, uh, uh, they should start uh, having a discussion with uh, uh, their physicians and what we call the term is the shared decision making. Because having a discussion about risk of prostate cancer on one side has a positive aspect that you can potentially pick up a cancer which is curable and will save lives. But on the other side, we can get onto a path where uh, a PSA discussion can provoke some anxiety. If PSA is approached a little bit too loosely and every PSA elevation results in a biopsy, there are risk of having infections and other problems with the biopsy and that it's a, something an issue. And then one of the important issue is uh, uh, how to understand prostate cancer in terms of its risk of doing bad things. What I mean is that having had a diagnosis of prostate cancer doesn't mean that everyone needs a treatment. And having a decision about that aspect, that who needs a treatment, who doesn't need a treatment is an important part of the conversation. And that is where a very deliberate, intellectually stimulating, shared decision-making discussion is an important discussion because we need to be aware what patients want. It is factored in with their lifestyles. It is factored in with their life expectancy. It is factored in with their ability to understand what the risks are of finding prostate cancer, what are the risks of the procedures if downstream we have to do it, what are the active surveillance discussions. All that combined starts with an interaction between a physician and a patient to know what is my risk of prostate cancer. And that usually starts at the age of 55 for most men, but can start earlier in, in black men or people who have a positive family history. Men with family history need to be aware that uh, uh, the fact that they have a family history positive doesn't ensure that they will get prostate cancer. They just have a little higher incidence of developing prostate cancer. And we need to factor in into that process that into our decision-making algorithm. Basically, we start early, we stay vigilant, and we have a conversations about uh, what kind of a risk we are talking about it. Off late, they have been a little bit more sophisticated uh, uh, tests which have become available. We call germline mutations. Basically, using the bodily tissue or the blood, we can do certain genetic analysis and to see if there are certain genes which are abnormal. I'll give an example of one of those genes. It's known as a DNA repair pathway gene, also known as a BRCA gene, or uh, the same one which we used to talk about in, in breast cancer. Presence of those mutations sometimes reduces the ability of body to manage the DNA damage which happens on a day-to-day wear and tear. And if there is a difficulty in repairing them, then some of the damaged DNA can continue proliferating and that's known as a mutational potential. And when the mutated gene is allowed to proceed, then there is a more chance of developing prostate cancer. So all that can be managed by an um, expert group who understand this germline mutation discussion, who understands the carcinogenesis, who understands what are the triggers and who understands what are the unique factors in a particular patient as to what's the likelihood of developing prostate cancer. So this is a conversation topic. This is not very easy black and white discussion. This involves factoring in a lot of facts into a process, into an algorithm, into a decision-making path, which is unique to an every patient. We have to kind of factor in all those things and involve patient and the family as to why we should be pursuing and prostate cancer detection in a particular individual. So as I talked about uh, that prostate cancer, even though carries the same name, can be very different cancer in three different individuals. One individual may have what we call a very indolent prostate cancer, has a prostate cancer, but it is not likely to progress very fast. It is not likely to be very virulent it's not likely to spread. And 95% chance this cancer will remain indolent uh, uh, in, in the prostate. Knowing 
that this is the cancer in a particular patient is of very paramount importance because this is a patient who is an ideally very suitable candidate for what we call active surveillance. So one treatment option is an active surveillance for a patient who has a very low risk or a low risk or sometimes intermediate risk prostate cancer. Then there are cancers which are likely to progress and we call them in an intermediate risk prostate cancer. They, we give a Gleason score to this discussion, Gleason 6, Gleason 7, Gleason 8, 9, and 10. So Gleason 7, and especially a good kind of in Gleason 7, what we call Gleason 7, 3 plus 4, could be a candidate for uh, either an active surveillance or in what we call curative intent treatment. And the curative intent treatment can start with the either removal using a robotic technology or an open approach or giving some or other kind of radiation. In this group of patients, there is another treatment which has become available, what we call a focal therapy, in which instead of approaching the whole gland as a target of treatment, we can pinpoint where exactly the cancer is between left and right side, between the distal and proximal side, between the back and the front side of the prostate, and then Using imaging, using MRI, using ultrasound, we can either put in a laser fiber or we can put in a freezing fiber or we can concentrate the heat waves using an ultrasound technology or we can use a gold nanoparticle so we can use <coughs> some other kind of an energy source targeting to that area to destroy that cancer. That is known as a focal therapy. And then comes the treatment for a more aggressive advanced cancers. And that's where we usually talk about a multimodality therapies. Most of the prostate cancer patients who have an aggressive prostate cancer in one stage or other end up needing what we call hormonal ablation treatment in which we deprive the body of uh, male testosterone, combine that with either surgery or radiation or in a sequence, and uh, then we treat that. Off late, uh, there have been a resurgence of a um, few newer modalities of treatment, and one of them is known as a thoracic, in which we have a targeting uh, antibody which takes a particular drug right to the cancer because cancer cells express something known as a PSMA, PSMA. And uh, we can tag it with some special kind of radiation emitting agents or some kind of an, uh, um, toxic drug and that drug will go directly to the cancer and can kill it. So these are the different treatment options uh, which are currently available. There is a lot of uh, research happening in uh, immunotherapy and targeted therapy for this cancer also, which you will learn about it as the time goes out, goes to the next step. We don't really don't uh, want to be in that situation, and but every now and then I do see a patient uh, with a very high PSA who has uh, difficulty in passing urine, uh, who is having pain in the pelvis, who is having bony pains, uh, who is losing energy, who cannot pee very well, and uh, all that can happen because we let didn't pick up the cancer early enough, and uh, then both the local symptoms, bony system symptoms and systemic symptoms uh, can come up and um, it's not a very comfortable state to be in. It indeed is a potentially curable disease. A lot depends on what kind of cancer and when in the journey of cancer did we diagnose it and what are the treatments given to the patient. But simple answer is yes, it's a potentially curable. So advancements in prostate cancer field are in subsections of uh, early diagnosis where we are looking at the genomics, we are looking at imaging, we are looking at uh, molecular targeting. Then advances have happened in the techniques of uh, how the cancer is being removed while removal is important, but uh, conservation or preservation of sexual function in the nerves and the continence is happening. There are advances which are happening in the uh, radiation therapy uh, methods as to how the radiation is delivered. There are advances which are happening in the molecular targeting using PSMA and other kind of treatment. There are advancements happening in field where instead of treating all the cancers just with the hormone deprivation, we have what we call a targeted therapy. Three different cancers in three different patients can have a different molecular driver. Some may be addicted to hormones, some may be addicted to DNA repair issues, some may be addicted to sugar. 
and we have to know which kind of in cancer this patient has and sometimes you can develop a targeted therapy so that's another advancement which is happening there are advancements happening in the field of predicting what's the likelihood of cancer coming back and that is happening based on the genomics and even what we call a deep learning and artificial intelligence is coming into a play here where uh, imaging is combining with the genomics and all of that all that data is being synthesized by supercomputers to predict what's the likelihood of which medicine will work well which patient is likely to have a recurrence so it's an exciting time for a prostate cancer field or for a prostate cancer scientist and then another aspect is in which we are trying to leveraging understanding of body's own defense mechanism what we call as an immune system and how we can train immune system to recognize rogue cap prostate cancer cells and if they start recognizing them then they potentially can control them or kill them so it's an exciting time my message to men would be that uh, don't be afraid of this cancer this is a common but potentially curable but the cure depends a lot on when we find this cancer so instead of not wanting to know about it at least have a conversation with your expert friends your doctors your urologist or amongst yourself to understand what's the likelihood of having cancer and if there is then one find an expert who can help you guide through this journey it is a curable cancer and i really feel very sad when i see a patient who presents in a very advanced stage first time in my office and we know that the options are limited we still try but this could have been a different story 5 years earlier 3 years earlier thank you